tell the world. Hi, I'm Johnny. This is Johnny Likes, the show where I talk about movies that I like. On today's episode, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite cops and robbers movies of all time. Today, Johnny Likes, The Usual Suspects. All right, you all know the drill. When your number is called, step forward and repeat the phrase you've been given. Understand? Now, The Usual Suspects was a crime thriller from 1995. It was directed by Brian Singer of X-Men 1 and 2 fame, among other things. Stars Kevin Spacey, Gabriel Byrne, Stephen Baldwin, Benicio Del Toro, and Kevin Pollock. Roger Verbal Kent, played by Spacey, is taken in by the authorities after an apparent drug heist goes bad the night before and leaves a whole bunch of people dead and the police want answers. The Verbal tells the police what happens, starting with a police lineup taking place in New York six weeks prior. The police have hauled in... Dean Keaton, played by Gabriel Byrne. He's a crooked ex-cop. Michael McManus, played by Stephen Baldwin. A top-notch entryman, as Verbal describes him. Uh, Fred Fenster, played by Benicio Del Toro, who is McManus' partner. And Kevin Pollock, uh, the explosive expert, who plays Todd Hockney. These are the usual suspects. These men are all guilty, just not of the crime they've been accused of today. So they're pretty sore about getting their night ruined by getting hassled by the cops and so they decide to take advantage of their time together in the holding cell or whatever it is after the interrogation and they plan a heist this heist involves much risk but much reward and plus it embarrasses the nypd naturally things go awry during the heist and we follow rebel's narration of the events leading up to the night before this is a real treat of a movie if you haven't if you haven't seen it, don't know anything about it, I would just uh, I'd just, just tar- turn this off right now. We'll go watch that movie and start right now again. So let's start with the performances. Um, this is one of Kevin Spacey's best performances, if not his best. Although looking back on the 90s, he was he he had some good good does some good acting. He's superb as Verbal, the soft-spoken, crippled con man. His performance is filled with such nuance. You really don't even realize how good he is until you've seen the movie a couple times. And you probably will rewatch it. Why I say that will become evident if you watch the movie. The way he's able to transform something simple such as looking around the room into... From something just not noticed at all into something much more is is very impressive. Gabriel Byrne is in fine form here as the crooked ex-cop who is trying to go straight for the sake of his himself and his DA girlfriend, uh, e- Edie Finneran. Uh, Stephen Baldwin is fun as the antagonistic kind of loose cannon of the group. Kevin Pollack plays Hockney with a measured sarcasm that comics tend to do so well. They tell the same jokes, and they have the same punchlines, but they don't laugh because they're not that type of joke. It's a it's an interesting take on comedy, or it's the, the flip side of comedy, I guess. I haven't seen Pollock in too much, but he, he's great here. He, he's very believable as a guy who just does not care. This is the first time that I became aware of Benicio Del Toro playing Fenster, the mumble-mouthed eccentric of the group. He takes what should be a nothing role and makes it into something pretty memorable. He's He's got, got a bunch of, like, weird little lines throughout the movie that this stick in your head. Uh, Chaz Palminteri is good as well as the interrogator Dave Kujan who is taking what ver- the story that Verbal is telling and he's trying to make it fit with his own preconceived ideas about what actually happened. Performance is all around excellent. So the direction and screenplay. Um, this is Brian Singer and Christopher McQuarrie's first big Hollywood movie. They've apparently been known each other since grade school, and they worked on another movie beforehand called Public Access. Now, I saw Public Access years ago, and I don't remember really a thing about it, other than it was a pretty good low-budget thriller. I can't really comment on that movie all that much. I don't remember anything about it, but other than it was okay. I'm not usually a fan of movies where it starts at the end. Uh, This one starts off with Keaton getting killed on a dock. I I can see why they did it in this case, and it's not just lazy or 
to bump up the story to make it seem less boring. There's actually a reason for it in this case, so I, I kind of forgive it. Macquarie's screenplay is something that I'm sure must be taught in film school to, to aspiring writers. It's just beat for beat, it's so good. The pacing is perfect. The audience is never wondering what's happening or why it's happening. And at the same time, they don't know what's going to happen next. Everything that's introduced earlier on in the film is paid off, which is like screenwriting 101. Not that I've taken any screenwriting classes, but I've heard other people say that. Uh, the, sto the story is original and clever. The dialogue is insightful, smart, and at times quotable. It's really not a surprise that this won the Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay that year. So the direction from Singer is impressive and confident, especially for a basically a first timer. The, the shots are all stylish and artistic, but not in a show offy way. They're never boring. Equal parts film noir and paranoid 70s thriller. That's got, that was kind of my take on it. Oftentimes this, the shot will start off on something completely unrelated to the characters and then pan over to the characters just because otherwise it would just be boring. Yeah, it gives you an unrelated visually curious aspect to this catch your eye and then it moves on to the characters where they can do their excellent dialogue and just move the story forward. Now there is a lot of dialogue in kind of bland, boring locations like a uh, good 40% of the or like 30% of the movie takes place in an just a cop's office and through different framing and angles and lighting and all, all those very all those uh filmmaking techniques they're able to take these what a lesser director would have is just a two shot going back and forth with characters just talking uh the camera moves around and you're, you're never bored uh you, you don't mo notice most of these shots and you're not really supposed to but after watching this movie several times i started to really notice the, the the talents of the craft involved here. So the score. This is one of my favorite movie scores. Uh, the the guy who does it is a frequent singer collaborator, a guy named John Ottman, who also happens to be a top-notch editor. He does both roles in this film. Two scenes that really stand out in my mind. One rightfully so, the other just because it, it, it just does. The first one that just does is um, early on in the film where it's this footage of a plane landing and it just does like three cuts that bounce along with the music. I don't know why, but I always just think of that when I think of this movie. And then there's the editing at the end with the with the montage. You'll know what I mean. Uh, very impressive work on both fronts. Here's just some stuff I liked about the movie that's not spoilery that I can talk about. The shot where the where the usual suspects are all put into the lineup at the beginning. That's great. Really just establishes everyone's character. Everyone's got their own kind of outfit on and shows this their the background of their lives where they were when they got hauled in uh, it's, it's a really an iconic shot and i think i'm pretty sure it's on the the cover of the movie uh, during the same scene is the reading of the the witness line i love the heist sequence i thought it was very well conceived and exciting and just a whole bunch of random lines which i'll just play right now how do you shoot the devil in the back what if you miss oh is that one about the hookup with a dysentery the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. I say he'll flip you. He'll what? Flip you. Flip you for real. Yeah, I'm shaking. Come on. Okay. Answer my question. And you hit me in the back. Hello? Yeah, those are good, right? Even out of context? Okay, time to move on to spoiler talk. So these are major spoilers initially. Uh, I am going to do some minor spoilers later. I'll... I'll have different symbols on the screen somewhere so you can tell if you really don't care or if you care a little bit, but I'm, I'm going to try and differentiate. This one's, I think this is a, this movie is worth it. So I was shocked by the ending of this movie where, if you've seen this, have you, were you guys shocked? Did you see it coming? I mean, like, I was like, no way, how? And then they go into that awesome montage and it just shows that uh, Spacey's been watching and just making this story up off the top of his head the whole time. Not only is he making this story up as he goes along, or at least part of it, but if this cop who has managed to get him into a room was a really good cop, he would catch on, because all the clues are right there in front of him. He's using all this this random crap he sees on the bulletin board. I love that, kind of a sticking it to the man right to his face. 
like enjoyed that. This was one of those movies where it was, as soon as it was over, I rewound it and watched it again. It was probably the first movie where I did that, other than maybe just obsessively watching like cartoons as a kid. But this was the first like real movie where I was like, whoa, I gotta watch that right now. I don't care if it's one in the morning, it's happening. And Spacey's performance, my God. Once so you realize just how good it is upon second watch, all of a sudden, pretty much everything he does, you're seeing it from a new perspective. His p police reading line, the first time he reads it, it just comes off as monot like he's just bored and it's kind of monotonous. The second time, it's like uh, pure malice. Uh, another one is when Spacey is looking around the cop's office when he's first brought in. Uh, the first time you watch it, he looks like a, like a prisoner who's just trying to see if he's going to get killed by anything. And then the second time, he looks more like a, uh, like a predator who's seeing what can he use as a weapon. Uh, the movie is full of little moments like that, and I, I just love it. Even the opening scene where uh, Soze is in a trench coat in front of Keaton... And you see him pull out the lighter and light his own smoke. And Keaton just sighs, goes, ah, oh, of course, you. Like, there's all these hints that the filmmakers give us. And I, I, for one, never suspected at all. And it all seems kind of obvious. Well, not kind of obvious, but the clues are all there. It's very much like a like a whodunit, where if you're paying attention, you can reasonably put it all together. So like I said, I never for a second suspected that Soze was was verbal. Although I did show this movie to my girlfriend a few years ago, and she didn't even realize that it was a twist. She thought that it was like obvious that he was, <laughs> that he was Soze the whole time. She's just like, oh, was that supposed to be a twist? Oh. Which made me feel pretty dumb, but... Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm in the majority of people and she's uh, just a, a good movie watcher and I'm just gullible. Maybe it was obvious to you, but it wasn't to me. <sighs> okay, moving down to minor spoilers here. This stuff won't ruin the film for you, but it will... Um, there, there just is, is stuff that I wouldn't have wanted to know going in. So, yeah, that's kind of the, the difference here. This is more stuff I liked about the film, but just less spoilery. Uh, the idea of a criminal boogeyman, uh, somebody who the, the criminals tell their kids about tonight, like, uh, I think Verbal says it at some point, don't rat on your dad or Kaiser Soze will get you. Like, that, that whole idea, I thought that was very charming and clever. And I wouldn't be surprised if uh, the John Wick guy, the guys who made John Wick saw this and that's that's where John Wick came from. Like, it seems like an obvious uh, homage or ripoff, whatever. Depends how much you like John Wick. I like the whole mythos around Kaiser Soze. I'm still not sure what my take on it is. Initially, when I saw the, the reveal, I thought Verbal was telling the truth and that that's what actually happened. But now I'm not sure if this was just a story he made up on the spot, if this was his favorite story that he heard, or if it is the actual truth. And I like that it's ambiguous and that you can argue for any, any or even other interpretations of it. That's always a, that's always a great thing in a movie. Uh, Kaiser Soze roughly translates to King Talk Too Much. That's, that's pretty clever. Again, with the hints. Uh, the scene where Baldwin shoots both security guards at once using two guns. Pretty badass. Enjoyed that. Uh, watching Spacey lose his limp down the street. I thought that was so cool. Uh, this is kind of embarrassing, but I actually used to used to do that for fun in the mall when I was like 12. I'd just be walking along and then with a little bit of a limp or something, and then I would slowly uh, just get rid of the limp just to mess with anybody who ha happened to be watching. But at the same time, like, what are you doing watching a 12-year-old? Mind your business. Mind your business. Really like the idea of New York's finest taxi service. I like the idea of the heist. I like the execution of the heist. I found it all very believable and plausible. Like, this is probably a tactic that's used all the time and works, and there's not much you can do about it. Oh, when it's revealed that uh, Hockney actually did pull off the job, and he just kind of shrugs, he's like, eh, what you gonna do? That's kind of funny. And I like the whole end of, the whole scene at the end of the boat, where it's kind of a look low-key homage to slasher films. I also liked how they set up the opening shot, showing the various barrels getting shot and gasoline leaking out. The camera's f fascination with the pile of ropes that it keeps on zooming in on. Okay, that's uh, the end of the spoilers here. So, to summarize, this movie has an excellent script, uh, an original and intricate story. The performances are all top-notch, with Spacey's being Oscar-worthy. The direction was great. The score was memorable. The 
pacing was perfect, and it was full of interesting ideas. So I'm going to rate this one a 5 out of 5. Any, any problems I have with the film are just absolutely inconsequential. There, there's nothing I would really change about it. And it's one of the best of the genre, and one of my favorite films of all time. With that said, at the time of this review, this movie is coming up on 30 years old, so it is a little dated in places. For the most part, that stuff doesn't really matter. Like the some of the costumes and just the, the amount of smoking and what have you. No cell phones. Like, yeah, it was 30 years ago. That It was a, di it was a different time. I, I think that it holds up quite well overall. And I think that it's going to continue to be looked upon as one of the best films of the 90s for years to come. So if you like this, I would recommend Snatch, Casino, and Heat. These are all wildly different films in tone from this one, but they're all intricately written crime movies with memorable characters, scenes, and performances. So, did you see the ending coming? Does this hold up? What's your favorite Cops and Robbers movie? Uh, let me know in the comments. That would be great. And if you could like and subscribe, that would be super duper. It's quick, free, and painless. Thanks for watching me rant about movies for a little bit. Tune in next episode to see what else Johnny likes. And like that, he's gone.